Washington, D.C.? It does. It does. And uh, by the way, there's 103 places in our nation's capital where there's verses of Scripture, some portion thereof, that talks about the Lord, talks about the Bible, portions of the Scripture, 103 locations. My brother said it well. If you were to try to remove all the vestiges of God from Washington, D.C., you'd have to tear the buildings down to do it. Now, CNN's not going to tell you that. MSNBC's not going to tell you that. Fox News is not going to inform you about that. But God is everywhere in our nation's capital. You see, we've turned our back on him. I understand that. The fact of the matter is this. Your pastor said it so well just a little bit ago. We were founded upon Judeo-Christian principles based on the Word of God. And what we need to do is get back to those once again in our nation and in our nation's capital. And when we do... There's hope for the United States of America, and there's hope for revival. And I ought to hear an amen right there. Tremendous hope for America, and tremendous hope for revival, and hope for uh, your home, for my home, hope for our cities, hope for our states. And so what we're doing is trying to take as much of this to Washington, D.C. as we possibly can. The Lord's given us a wonderful relationship, tremendous relationship with the folks at the Museum of the Bible. I won't go into all of that, explain what God's been doing, but it's just phenomenal. I was sharing with Pastor over in his office just a little bit before the service some things that God's up to that I can't really share with you publicly. But it's amazing what God's doing to call our elected officials back to the God of the Bible. And you say, preacher, uh, I'm not seeing a lot of that happening right now. Do you understand there is a a vortex that's been created. Good and evil are in direct conflict right now. In the midst of all of that, there's some amazing things that are happening behind the scenes. And I wish I could go into all of it, and I can't. But suffice it to say this, we serve an awesome God. We really, really do. Turn, if you would, please. If you already should have your Bible, Matthew chapter number 24. Once you look at verse number 3, Matthew 24, verse 3, the scripture says, And as he, and the he here is Jesus, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, and I want you to note the question they asked the Savior, What shall be, or when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Now, I want you to look up at me. The first question they ask is this, when shall these things be? Now, what they're asking is, Jesus, when's it going to happen that what you've just told us is going to occur? What Jesus had just told them is this, there's going to come a day when the temple that you're looking at here on Temple Mount is going to be so thoroughly destroyed, not one stone's going to be left sitting on top of another. And like most human beings, the disciples were more preoccupied with a building than they were the souls of men. Is everybody listening to what I'm saying? So when's it going to happen, Jesus, that the temple's going to be destroyed? I want you to know Jesus doesn't even take a second to address that question. He's not interested in the temple. But the second question the disciples ask, Jesus is very interested in, and he takes the rest of the chapter to answer it. The second question is, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? What I want to do tonight, very quickly, is I want to preach to you on this topic, signposts of the second coming signpost of the second coming. Now, I want to want to have you just give me your rapt attention for just a couple of minutes so I'll try to set up where we're going to go very, very quickly. Have any of you ever visited Niagara Falls in upstate New York? Anybody ever been to Niagara Falls? Have any of you done what I did? I'd heard, Pastor, that this was the case. And so I found out where it was, and we actually drove to the location before we went to the falls. I heard that 3.2 miles upstream from the precipice of the U.S. side of Niagara Falls, there is a sign on the side of the bank. And sure enough, there is, and it literally has two words on it. Anybody go see it? Anybody ever done this like I did? The two words are these, danger zone, danger zone. 3.2 miles upstream from the precipice of the U.S. side of Niagara Falls, there is a sign that says danger zone. That means this, folk, the current at that point is so fast The pull is so strong that unless you have a motor, some type of mechanized device on the back of your vessel from 3.2 miles from the precipice of the U.S. side of the falls, unless you got a motor on the back of your boat, you're going over. Danger zone. Preacher, I'd heard this was the case, and sure enough, I went there to see it. Three quarters of a mile approximately from the precipice of the U.S. side of Niagara Falls, there is an island in the middle of the Niagara River. Right in the middle of the island, as you approach it, there is a second sign. That sign has four words on it. And the four words are these, point of no return. Point of no return. 
What that means is this. I don't care what you, you can have four mercury outboards on the back of your boat, but if you get past that sign, you're going over. Is everybody with me? Point of no return. You say, preacher, why are you telling us this? Folks, I want you to understand tonight where we're here, the United States of America, the world, every one of us in this room, we are somewhere between the danger zone and the point of no return. Is everybody listening to me? Jesus is going to come back. And he's coming back, I believe, sooner rather than later. And when he does, wherever you are, whatever's going on in your life, if you're saved, you're going out of here in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. If you're not saved, you're going to be left behind. So tonight, we're in a precarious position, somewhere between the danger zone and the point of no return. The disciples asked Jesus a very pointed question, what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world. Folk, the things that Jesus tells his disciples look like they have been ripped from the pages of the Charlotte Observer. You say, preacher, what do you mean? I want you to look at Matthew 24, verse 7. Buckle in tight. We're going to move quickly. In Matthew 24, verse 7, in answer to the disciples' question, what are the signs of your coming or this sign of your coming and the end of the world? Signpost number one is in Matthew 24, verse 7. I implore you to write it down. It is literally called this division racially. Division racially. You say, preacher, where do you get that? Look at Matthew 24, verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now look up at me for just a minute. It sounds like Jesus is saying the same thing twice. Nation's going to rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom, as if nations and kingdoms are the same things. Folk, I am a word nut, and I'm not correcting the Bible. I'm trying to explain the Bible, but there's two different words being used here. The word nation is actually the Greek word ethnos. From which, yes, we get the English word ethnic, ethnic group, ethnicity. When Jesus said nation, ethnos is going to rise up against ethnos. And then kingdom, that's the Greek word basileia. You say, what is a basileia? Basileia against basileia. A basileia is a country. It has territorial boundaries. It has a leader or a ruler over it. So it's not two times saying the same thing. What Jesus is saying is two different things. In the last days, signpost number one is not just countries warring, but ethnic groups are going to be going at one another. There's going to be division racially. Signpost number one of the second coming. You say, preacher, are we watching that go on in our world? How about you answering the question? Are we watching that go on in our world? Folks, do you understand a lot of division, a lot of unnecessary division occurred during the COVID time, whether you wear a mask or you don't wear a mask, whether you take a shot, whether you don't take a shot. Listen, all of that ought to be an individual choice. And as I said yesterday, whatever your choice is, bless your heart, you pray, you get the will of God, you make your choice, and then you live with it. Can I hear an amen? But we got divided over shots, masks, and the devil brought division even into the church over stuff that there should be no division over. Priester, I still believe in the priesthood of the believer, don't you? I believe as an individual priest before God, I don't have to go through you, I don't have, you don't have to go through me, we don't have to go through anybody else, but we pray, God, what do you want me to do and what God tells us to do, which may be a little different than what God wants somebody else to do, we just do that. Can I hear an amen? But here's what really breaks my heart as a nation. We were divided during the COVID years Racially. It was amazing. Do you know what's happening in our world right now? We've got blacks against whites, whites against blacks. We've got Hispanics against blacks, Hispanics against whites. We've got all kinds of problems going on in our world. Folks, pay attention up here. They've got it under control. We've got somebody stirring the ethnic pot. Can I tell you, folks, the person that's doing that is the devil. Well, no, it's the Democrats. No, it's the Rep- no, it's not the D or the R. It's the devil himself. Satan himself is stirring the ethnic pot. And if we're not careful, the church of Jesus Christ is going to fall into it. Division racially. I want you to watch your Bible. Not only division racially, signpost number two. 
If you look at Matthew 24, verse 4, look what the Bible says. Jesus repeats something four times in this chapter. And I want you to watch verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, that is his disciples, take heed that no man, would you say the next word out loud? Take heed that no man do what to you? Deceive you. Look at verse number five. For many shall come, that is in the last days, many are going to show up in my name saying, I am Christ. In other words, I am the Messiah and shall do what to many? Would you say it again? Deceive many. Look at Matthew 24 verse number 11. And many false prophets shall rise. That is in the last days, there's going to be an abundance of false prophets and they shall do what to many? Would you say it out loud? Deceive many. Look at Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they should do what to the very elect? What's the word? Now, folk, watch me. Matthew 24, 4, Matthew 24, 5, Matthew 24, 11, and Matthew 24, 24. Four times Jesus says, here's signpost number two. Not just division racially, but number two, deception religiously. Deception Religiously. Now, folks, please look up at me. I know some of you are taking notes. I love that. But I want you to not miss something. The deception of the last days is not just any kind of deception. It's not used car salesman deception. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Any of you ever bought a used car? Okay. All right. Uh, This is not in the last days. The deception is not political leadership deception. By the way, I heard a guy tell me one time, he said, I I went into the hospital room with this guy that was dying. He said, I want the guy I bought my last car from on this side. He said, I want my local representative that I voted for on this side. And the son asked him, Daddy, why do you want that? He said, I want to die like my Savior with a thief on either side of me. Okay, listen, I I get that. I understand that. But the deceptions we're talking about here that Jesus mentions in Matthew 24 are not used car salesman deceptions and not political leadership deception. In context, Pastor, it is religious deception. Many are going to be on the scene in the last days saying, I'm Christ. There's going to be many false prophets, false teachers arrive on the scene in the last days and they're going to deceive even if it were possible the very elect of God. Folks, can I ask you a question? Are we watching that happen or what? Do you know there's a thing and I alluded to it yesterday and I don't want to camp out on it but folks, it's vitally important. It literally created a firestorm in the state of Virginia and thank God there arose a whole new voting block in the state of Virginia. You say, what's the new voting block? I call them education voters. It was moms and dads, grandmoms and granddads that were sick and tired of their kids being told something that wasn't true. Do you know what they're being told in Virginia? America is an inherently racist country. We were founded as an inheritance. Can I say this, folks? That is not true. Did America have a past where we tolerated something that should have been done away with well before it was? And the answer is yes, we did in a thing called slavery. But here's the beauty of America. Unlike other countries, preacher, we have corrected a good number of our problems. Can I hear an amen and a hallelujah? No, there's no perfect country. But America was not founded as an inherently racist country. Now this thing that's being pushed in our schools and even being promoted in Bible college seminaries, a thing called CRT, critical race theory. Part of critical race theory, because it comes from a thing called critical theory, they say critical race theory is this. Number one, America was an inherently racist country, so America is bad from the get-go. That's not true. May I say this, folks? It also says this. The way we find, this is what critical race theory teaches, the way we find our collective salvation. By the way, that ought to raise a red flag right there. Preacher, there's no such thing as collective salvation. There is only individual salvation. Every person ever born is born with a sinful nature. And that sinful nature, I'm going to use this kind of terminology, that's a blood disease that I had inside of me when I was born. But preacher, your mom and dad, your dad was a pastor, your mom was a pastor's wife, that's right. But they had passed on to them by their parents and they conceived my twin brother and I, passed it on to us, they passed on a sinful nature. So I was born a sinner. So you know what? I don't get collectively saved with the rest of you. I have to be saved individually. 
When I understand I'm a sinner and I admit that and I say, oh God, would you forgive me? And Jesus, I believe you died on that old rugged cross, shed your blood there to forgive me and I'm asking you on purpose, deliberately, to come into my heart and life, forgive me and save me. I'm tired of going my way. God, I want to go your way. And if that happens, we can be born again individually. CRT says the way we earn our collective salvation is to back up and right the wrongs of the past. Let me ask you a question. How do we today back up and right a wrong that occurred in the 1800s? Preacher, we can't do that. By the way, last time I checked, I've never owned a slave. You never owned a slave. But they're saying, no, we got to, and that's where this thing of reparations comes. We got to pay reparations to certain groups in order to back up to something that occurred over 160 years ago, and we write it, and by doing so, we could gain our collective salvation by writing a 160 year old wrong. Folks, that's absurd. Let me explain how absurd it is. What if, brother, the next time you met me, every time I was around you, and by the way, this brother has a lot of questions that he likes to ask. Amen. And I don't mind them. I love every one of them. And we do our best to try to answer them. And we've connected at the heart, brother. I'm just telling you, we have. But if the next time you saw me, every night I come in, every night, here's what you heard me say. Those Japanese. Do you know what those Japanese did to us? In 1941, December 7th? The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And they killed X number thousand of our Men and women in uniform, those Japanese, those Japanese. If every time you saw me, all I brought up was the Japanese, the Japanese, the Japanese. Do you know what? If you loved me, if you loved me, you know what you would do? You'd say, preacher, (laughs) you're talking and bringing up something that happened 70 years ago. It's over and done. Move on. Amen. Amen then how come do we allow the media? How come do we allow false teachers to try to back us up not 70 years, but 170 years almost and keep scraping the scab off of a national wound that was just about healed? Is everybody with me? You say, why are they doing it? It's not that they care about anybody or what happened to anybody in the past. They're trying to create division in our nation. And this is creeping into pulpits and has crept in all over the United States of America. Thank God it hasn't crept into the pulpit of Calvary Baptist Church in Union Grove, North Carolina. Preacher, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the signposts of the second. Preacher, it's like this is being ripped out of today's newspapers. Signpost number one, division racially. Signpost number two, deception. Religiously, signpost number three. I want you to watch your Bible. Look at Matthew 24, verse 7 again. I want you to see this with your own eyes. Jesus said, For nation, ethnos, ethnic group shall rise up against nation, ethnic group, and kingdom, literally country, basileia is the Greek word, country shall rise up against country. Look at the last part of verse 7, and there shall be famines. And would you say the next word out loud? Pestilence says, plural, look at the last one, and earthquakes. In divers, the word divers means diverse. Literally plain English, all sorts of. Going to be earthquakes in all sorts of places. What signpost number three of the second coming of Jesus Christ? Not just division racially and deception religiously. Number three, destruction generally. Famines pestilences, plagues, and earthquakes in all sorts of places. Now, folks, I'd love to camp out tonight, and I'm not going to do it. But we just came through three years' worth of a plague. Preacher, do you deny the reality of coronavirus? I've never one time denied the reality of coronavirus. But uh, what I have questioned a lot is our response to the reality of the coronavirus. Everybody with me? The virus is real. I've had it. Some of you have had it. Some of you, like me, have loved ones and dear friends that are his closest family that have died as a result of it. I have never questioned the reality of it one time. But our response to the reality of it, I've questioned a lot. May I share this with you? 
One of my dearest pastor friends on the planet, pastors in Drexel, North Carolina. Do you know what he did? He took me from standing right here in his church. He said, preacher, come with me. I want to show you something. We walked on Sunday morning before the service started down the center aisle all the way through the foyer, out the back door and to the foyer, the, the, the steps on the front of the church. He said, preacher, I want you to look across the street at that house over there. I'm looking literally across a two-lane road at a house. The pastor said, in that house are two not only of the best people I've ever met in my life, but two of my greatest church members they're both in their 80s they love Jesus with all their heart he said Dave here's the deal they bought into everything the news media sold everything Mr. Fauci my brother calls him Mr. Fauci fake chi by the way, folk, I'm not trying to be political, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping there's going to be some changes in the makeup of Congress come November because that little man needs to stand accountable for some stuff he did. He's got blood on his hands. Preacher, you're upset. You don't know the half. By the way, Pastor, I've got a nephew who's a missionary about two hours from Wuhan, China. And when this whole thing started, he sent a message to the entire family and said, you're going to be hearing a lot of stuff that, you know, this thing started out of a wet market, you know, and it crossed over from the animal world into the human world. He said before anybody was reporting on it in the news, he said, don't you believe a word of it? He said, it started actually, courtesy of Mr. Fauci, at UNC in Chapel Hill. And when they found out what he was doing, it's called gain of function research. He took it to Wuhan, China. Whether it was released on purpose or accidentally, we don't know. But it started there. And they've lied to us. So I had a leg up through the whole early part of this. And when I saw the lies coming and heard them coming, I noted what my nephew, who has got his earned doctor's degree, had told me about what was going on medically. Folk, please hear me. A lot of lies were told. A lot of deception accepted during the entire COVID time. My folk, here's the deal. During those three years called COVID, especially 2020, my pastor friend said, Dave, that dear couple, I love them. They're two of the greatest people I've ever met. They're two of the greatest church members I've ever pastored. They love Jesus, but they bought into everything Fauci sold. To this point, Every time food was delivered to their house, I said, delivered. He said, yes, Dave, they have not left the house in over a year. Every item of food's been delivered. By the way, did any of y'all fall into that? We did temporarily. My wife would go to the store and she'd bring home, you know, that elixir that is going to flow in the river of life, you know. And when I get up into heaven, I'm going to take me a straw and dip it into the river of life and inhale for about a thousand years. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's called Mountain Dew, by the way. That's, I'm, I'm just... <laughs> She'd bring the six-pack of Mountain Dew home, and I'd stop her on the carport. I'd say, stop, stop, stop right there, honey. And I'd come with my wipes, my sanitizing wipes, and I would wipe everything down, not even thinking that, wait a minute, wait a minute. What if the virus didn't jump on the food items? It jumped on my wife's clothes. I'm not wiping her clothes down. And then I got to thinking, how insane is this? My pastor friend said, no, Dave, that couple has not left their house in over a year. Everything has been thoroughly sterilized before it's gone into their house because they're in their 80s. The family's concerned. I get that. I totally get that. He said, but here's the deal, preacher. Not having left the house in over a year and everything thoroughly sanitized before it goes in the house. He said, you know right now both of them have COVID. He said, so I got a question. If that's what we're dealing with and it's that contagious, you stay in your house for a year and you still get it, there's no avoiding it. In other words, it's in the hands of Almighty God. As is everything. This has been a pestilence. But I want you to notice Matthew 24, 7 doesn't say pestilence singular. It says pestilence says plural. There's going to be more than just one plague in the end time. By the way, folk, we're dealing with monkey pox. Some people are calling it donkey pox. <laughs> Ebola. Plagues 
in the last days. Now, I could camp out there. I'm not. But I want you to look at the last word, the last thing predicted as part of the destruction generally in the last days. Signposts of the second coming. Earthquakes in all sorts of diverse, totally different places. Do any of you remember about seven years ago when an earthquake hit a very unusual location? Washington, D.C. And I'm not talking about a political earthquake. I'm talking about a geological earthquake. Anybody remember this? Literally, literally, I watched the video. I watched it. By the way, you can still pull it up on YouTube as far as I know. Last time I checked, it was there. These tourists had gone up to the top of the Washington Monument. 555 feet tall is the Washington Monument. Tallest structure in Washington, D.C. Three different stages on the, actually four, four different places on the inside of the Washington Monument. They used to let you walk it. By the way, I did it when I was a young man. They don't let you do that anymore. Have to take an elevator from the bottom to the top. But I've literally climbed, ran a good portion of it when I was 17 years of age. We ran a good portion of the 555 feet. Do you know at four different locations on the inside of the Washington Monument, there's verses of Scripture? One of them says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. Can I hear an amen? amen? A little bit further up is a portion of Exodus 38, 6, the part that says holiness to the Lord. Can I hear an amen? And two other places. The day the earthquake hit D.C., epicentered about three miles outside Washington, D.C., do you know that Washington Monument rocked back and forth 18 inches? The video you can pull up on YouTube is from the inside, a camera inside the Washington Monument. The elevator doors open up. A group of people get ready to get off. It looks like they're all part of one family. And all of a sudden, the earthquake hits, and you can literally see the monument rocking. You can see the park service officer going, get down, get down. They start to go in the elevator. No, 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 don't get on the elevator. Go down the steps, and she's hurrying them down as the monument rocks back and forth. 18 inches. Preacher, about five days later, after they shut the monument down, they bring in a helicopter and they lower a gentleman from a tether line onto the top of the Washington Monument. I watched all of this on the news. I heard it was going to happen. Anybody watch it like I did? He harnesses in around the point of the Washington Monument and rappels down the monument, all 535 feet, checking where the cracks are. And they kept the monument closed for about eight months. And once it was fully repaired, they reopened it. You say, preacher, what are you trying to tell us? Folk, listen, there's earthquake zones in our nation. But D.C.'s not one of them. What Jesus is saying is this. As sure as you see this happening, earthquakes in all sorts of places. That is a signpost that I'm about to come back. By the way, it's what the Apostle Paul said in the last days. The whole earth is going to groan and travail, waiting for our redemption. Can I hear an amen? And by the way, the redemption is the rapture. Can I hear an amen? Wow. Groan and travail, it's birthing terminology. You know what a woman does when she groans and travails? He shakes, she shakes as she's getting ready to give birth to a baby. The earth is going to groan and travail. And we're watching it happen. Jesus, what's the signpost of your second coming? Division racially, deception religiously, destruction generally. I want you to take your Bible, turn one last place. I want you to look, if you would, please, at 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. I want you to turn there. I want you to see it with your own eyes. There is a fourth signpost of Jesus' soon return. Look at 2 Timothy 3. Let your eyes rest on verse number 1. I want you to see this as I read it. By the way, as I read through here, you're going to notice a litany. The word litany means a long list of things that are going to be characteristic of the time just before Jesus comes back. The list falls into three categories. Some of the words are literally attitude words. Some of the words are action words and some of the words are affection words or phrases. What is the fourth signpost? Not only deception religiously, division racially, destruction generally, but number four, there's going to be a disposition culturally. Culture preacher is going to take on a disposition in the last days. As we get close to Jesus' return, I want you to see what Paul told Timothy was going to be the disposition of the culture that Jesus is going to come back to. Look at verse 1. 
This know also that in the last days, the days that precede, immediately precede Jesus' return, what kind of times are going to come? Would you say the word out loud? What kind of times? Perilous. It means troublesome. Troublesome times are going to come. Now, in beginning in verse number two, Paul gets very specific about the troublesome times. He begins mentioning affections, actions, and attitudes. Watch this. For men, here comes the first affection phrase, men shall be lovers of their own selves. Now, folk, look up at me. Do you know what we've been told for about 30 years? You know what your problem is as, as a human being? I've had people literally tell me this. You know what your problem is, Dave? I said, no, tell me. What's my problem? Your problem is you don't know how to love yourself. I said, really? You really believe that? And this was a Christian psychologist telling me, Dave, you don't, you don't know how to love yourself. I said, well, can, can I just ask you this? My Bible says this, no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord does the church. By the way, have you ever been up on a, a building nailing a 20-penny nail and missed the 20-penny nail and hit your thumbnail? You ever done that? You'll find out how much you love you. I've done that. Drop the hammer, grab my thumb. Some people don't, don't grab it with the other hand. They'll do this. You know what you're screaming? Same thing I was. I love me. I love me. No man ever yet hated his own flesh. The guy said, what are you trying to tell me? I said, brother, listen, listen. I know you got the psychology degree, but I'm going based on what the Bible says. I think my problem is not that I don't know how to love myself enough. I think my problem is I love myself too much. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's an affection phrase. Look at the next one. Not only lovers of their own selves, covetous. That's an attitude. Boasters, that's an action. Proud, that's an attitude. Blasphemers, that's an action disobedient to parents. That's an action phrase, isn't it? By the way, young people, may I say this? I've never, I love you. I, I'm a teenager trapped in a 63-year-old body. That's what I am. I love young people, but I'm here to tell you something. I've never seen anything like it. The violent disrespect on the part of children toward their own mom and dad. I'm here to tell you something. You were talking about your dad being 88, 86. Mom's 88. He married the proverbial older woman, didn't he? Wow. Don't you tell him I said that. But anyway, don't tell her I said that. Anyway, folk, hear me out. Do you know if I ever sassed my mom? In fact, my dad told me, looked at me, looked at my twin brother, said, don't you boys ever sass mom. Don't you ever talk back to mom. Don't you ever do that. Can I just say what my dad said? Can I just say it? Okay, I'm just going to say it. My dad said, if either of you boys ever sass your mom, I will take my size 10 and a half shoe. I'll kick you so hard in your backside, it will knock your rear end up around your neck, and you'll have to unbutton your collar to go to the bathroom. That's what he said. <laughs> and just like you, I'm, my brother too, we're doubled over laughing. You say your dad was an ogre. No, my dad was hysterically funny. But I knew he was serious. So you know what? We didn't sass mom. Can they hear an amen? Man, if we'd ever talk back to mom, that'd be bloodshed in the woodshed, if you know what I'm talking about. And I know I've told you before, but I'm going to say it again. My dad was a very patriotic disciplinarian. That means this. He laid down the stripes and we saw the stars. That's what it means. <laughs> Well, you must have hated your dad. No, I grew up loving my dad because I respected my dad. Can I hear an amen? Yes, Disobedient to parents is part of the cultural disposition of the end time. Look at the rest of it. Not only disobedient to parents, look at the next one. The next one there in verse number three says, uh, or verse number two says, unthankful. That's an attitude. Unholy, that can be an attitude or an action. Here comes the second affection phrase. Look at verse three. Without natural affection. Boy, are we living there. Folks, I could camp out, I'm not. But I want to say this, it is not. The animal kingdom treats their offspring better than humans do. 
I was driving down a two-lane road and watched, preacher, it was amazing, a little mother duck with her little ducklings following her across the road. And one of them got sidetracked by something. And once the mama got all the others across, she came back, risked her life to nudge the other one across the road. Can I hear an amen? amen. What in heaven's name is going on when we've accepted the unmitigated murder of the unborn? Thank God. Thank God. The Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Man, we ought to be shouting from the rooftops. Preacher, that's political. No, it's not. That's moral. Wow. And by the way, I'm, so, I'm not trying to be political. I'm so thankful for the 45th president who said, if I'm elected, I'll appoint strict constructionist interpreters of the Constitution. And he got to appoint three of them. And you know what? Because of those three, preacher, Roe v. Wade was overturned. Can I hear an amen? amen. But Brother Dave, the 45th president would tweet stuff. You know what I've started telling people when they tell But he would, he would tweet mean stuff. I'm looking at people and say, please tell me. You're not equating a mean tweet with the unmitigated murder of the unborn. Please tell me you're not creating moral equivalency there because there is none. My soul, have we lost our minds. Do you know what also is not natural? It's not natural for a man to burn in lust for another man. Or a woman to burn in lust for another woman. Preacher, we were in the island of St. Vincent. I was standing on a back porch of a missionary's home there on the island of St. Vincent. My bride didn't get to go. Our pastor went with us. His bride didn't get to go. We have our hands on the railing looking over this beautiful Caribbean sunset. And my pastor, funny as a rubber crutch. Some of y'all get that in a minute. But anyway, he's just funny. He looked over at me and he said this. I'll never forget it. He said, now, isn't this some place to be with another man? I said, preacher, what does that mean? He said, how come you have to be standing there in this romantic scene instead of my bride? I said, well, I was thinking the same thing. How come you have to be standing there instead of Betsy? But I wasn't going to verbalize it. <laughs> my pastor said this. I have never forgotten it. He said, you know what, Dave? I've been tempted by a lot of stuff. But homosexuality is not one of them. I said, preacher, I'm with you. You know why? That's not natural. Without natural affection. Look at verse 3. Truce breakers, that's an action. False accusers, that's an action. Incontinent, it means lacking in self-control. That's an action. Look at the next word, fierce. By the way, that word means literally ferocious. Any of you watching what's happened in the last week where they beat to death a man in a wheelchair? A guy slips up behind another guy in New York and sucker punches him and knocks him down and the guy ultimately, I think, dies as a result of the punch. How ferocious do you have to be to do stuff like this? What in the world? Jesus said, the culture is going to take on this disposition. The closer you get to my return. So look for it. Look at the rest of verse number three. Despisers of those that are good. That's an action and an attitude. Look at verse four. Traitors, action. Heady, arrogant, attitude. High-minded, another form of arrogance, attitude. Here comes the final affection phrase. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now I want you to watch verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, what's the next two words? Would you say it out loud? Stay away. Stay as far away from those people that are listed in this litany of things that are characteristic of the culture in the last, stay away from them. The last one Paul mentions, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to do so, is having a form of godliness. Now, I want to ask you a question. What is that that I'm holding up? Just talk back to me. What is it? Hand. Okay? <laughs> not trying to embarrass you, put you on the spot, but I do need to say this. Technically, that's not a hand. It's a picture of a hand. Yeah, it's an outline of a hand. Okay, right? 
<laughs> Not a hand, it's an outline of one. Now, would you help me with something? Would you take your left mitt and would you just put it up inside of that outline? Okay, now, other than the sensation of the paper touching your fingers, other than that sensation, which you will feel, is there anything else you feel? And what I mean by that is this. Do you feel any warmth coming from the paper? Do you feel anything gripping back? Other than just the sensation of your fingers touching the paper, do you feel anything else? Warmth or anything gripping? No. You know why? Because that's not real. That's just an outline. Now promise me you won't hurt me. You promise, all right? Because I'm an old man, okay? Put your left hand right there. Do you feel something there? Yes, so do I. Easy, 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 okay? So do I. You know why? Because that and that are real. That's more real than this one. But anyway, this is not real. It's just an outline. Do you know when Paul said in the last days the cultural disposition is going to take this characteristic on, people are going to have a form. Do you know the word form, preacher, literally means an outline. They're going to have a tracing of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. There's no living, are you with me? There's no living reality. Can I hear an amen? They just look the part. They know how to talk the talk. When it comes to walking the walk, there's no power to do that. Folk, we're there. We are there. We are there. We are there. What's the signpost, Jesus, of your second coming? Division racially. Deception religiously. Destruction generally. Famine, pestilence, earthquakes. And number four, a disposition culturally. Preacher, I'm going to say it this way. I'm surprised we're still here. I'm surprised Jesus hadn't come back yet. Fact is, he hasn't. Which means this, we got a lot of work to do, don't we? We're to occupy till he comes. Occupy doesn't just mean occupy like sitting in a chair. It means to be actively engaged till Jesus comes. Folk, I want to tell you something. My wife and I did it January a year ago. We did it this past January. We'll do it again this upcoming January in about four months. We'll do it for the third time. We'll meet together and we'll pray. And we'll say to the Lord, Lord Jesus, at the outset of this new year, 2023, if we get there and he he hasn't come back, we're going to say, Jesus, we're all in. We're all in. You've got every bit of us. I'm not holding back. I'm not going to hedge anything. I'm going to tell people in love, but I'm going to tell them the truth. Because I'm all in. Jesus, till you come back to take me home. Because we've got work to do. Now, church, hear me, and I'm done. This week will be worth every investment if one thing happens. And that you get to the place where you're willing to say to the Lord and mean it, Lord, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm all in. Till you come back to take me home or I draw my last breath on this earth, I'm all in for my Savior. Boy, if we get there, we will have had revival. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, would you speak to us tonight? Lord, please don't let us be careless or foolish at this critically important point in the service. Father, I pray if there's a man, woman, young person in this room that does not know you as Savior yet, they're not genuinely born again, Father, I pray you'd show them their need. I pray you'd convict them of their sin and draw them to yourself. And Lord, if there are those watching online right now or will watch, hours, days, perhaps even weeks down the road if you tarry. And they watch this service and they're not sure they're going to heaven. Father, I pray, I pray before it's too late that they would call upon you and be saved. And Father, for what you're going to do, I'm going to thank you and give you great glory.
Now, friends, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to do something really different tonight. How many of you in the room can say with absolute certainty, Dave, of this I'm sure, Jesus is my Savior. I know I'm born again. I know I'm going to heaven. I don't have a doubt about it. I know absolutely for certain I'm saved. If you know that's true, would you lift your hand, hold it as high as you possibly can. Preacher, I know I'm saved. Thank you. You may put your hand down. Bless your heart. Now, what I'm about to do applies in the room as well as online. I don't want you to raise a hand to this. I want you to answer it in your heart. Don't raise a hand. Answer it in your heart. Here in the room, online, answer it in your heart. Is there someone in this room watching online that does not know for sure that you're born again? You don't have the assurance that your sin has been forgiven. You don't know for absolute certain that if you died unexpectedly tonight or Jesus came back in the rapture tonight, you're not sure you'd go to heaven because you don't know that you've been saved. Dear friend, could I ask you something? Are you not concerned about that because you need to be? Are you concerned enough that you're willing to do something about your need of Jesus. Now, whether it's online or here in the room, here's where I'm going to do something different. If you're not sure yet that you're going to heaven, could I implore you, right where you're seated in the room, right where you are watching online, either on your computer or your personal device, if you're not sure that Jesus is your Savior, but you want to know you're going to heaven. Would you not be willing simply to do this? Would you not be willing to call out to Jesus right now and ask Him to forgive and save you? Well, Dave, how would I do that? I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. By the way, there is no magic in the prayer. It's not the words of the prayer that saves. It's your faith being placed in what Jesus did for you when he died on that old rugged cross, was buried and rose again the third day. But you can express your faith in a very simple prayer. So if you're not sure you're going to heaven, whether you're watching online or here in the room, could I implore you, could I beg you? Would you not be willing just sincerely but silently Do you not be willing just to pray these words from your heart and mean it? Dear Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I know I cannot save myself. But I believe you died, were buried, and rose again the third day to forgive my sin. So right now, Jesus, On purpose, I'm asking you to forgive me, to come into my heart and life and save me. Give me the assurance of eternity with you. Thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness and your salvation. Now help me to live for you till you take me home to be with you. Now, folks, with our heads still bowed, our eyes still closed. If you prayed that prayer watching online tonight, there is a number on the page that you're watching this service at. That number will connect you with people that are waiting right now to answer the telephone. Could I implore you to just call that number? And tell them, I prayed. I prayed that prayer and asked Jesus to forgive and save me. And I meant it. And those folks that are going to answer the phone would love nothing more than to pray further with you and offer you some advice. Send something to you that will be a great help to you in your new walk with the Lord. Just call that number. Now for those of us in the room, I'm not doing this to embarrass you. I just want to know how to pray from this point on. Is there anyone in the room that would say, you know what, Dave? I came in here tonight. I didn't know for sure I was going to heaven. But I prayed that prayer after you and I meant it. I asked Jesus to forgive and save me. I'm not ashamed. I'm not afraid to admit that. 
I prayed that prayer right here in the room tonight. I did. If you did that, I wonder if, while I'm the only one looking, I wonder if you'd be willing to lift your hand just long enough for me to take note of it so that I might pray for you further and rejoice with you. Anyone like that? Dave, I prayed that prayer. Tonight, after you, and I'm in it from my heart, and I ask Jesus to forgive and save me. Anyone like that? You'd lift your hand long enough for me to take note of it. All right, one final question. Christian friends, I want to address this to us. Please hear me out. Tomorrow night, I'm going to bring what may be the most important message I've ever preached. By the way, this is the question I am asked more than any other. Brother Dave, what happens to America? We're not mentioned by name in Bible prophecy, and you know what? We're not. Other nations are mentioned, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Germany, Libya, Syria. Those nations and several others are mentioned in the end time scenario. But the United States is not. So preacher, what happens to us? Are we referred to somewhere in the prophetic portions of the scripture some other way? What happens to us? So tomorrow night I'm going to preach on this topic. Is America in Bible prophecy? I'm going to take you to two passages of Scripture that I think are going to be eye-opening as I endeavor to answer that question. Please be here. Because that's where God's directed me, tonight I need to ask this question of God's people. You're going to understand tomorrow night why I'm doing this. Three Januaries, it will be this coming January, as I've already said, my wife and I will have said to the Lord, we're all in. We're all in. In fact, my sweet bride said to me, Honey, you're more direct than you've ever been. I said, Yes, I am. I'll tell you why. Because I'm aware of what's coming. Both biblically and because of our ministry on Capitol Hill, I'm privy to other information as well. So I've got to say something. I've got to say something. I can't be quiet. She said, I don't want you to be. She said, I'm with you. 100%. We're all in together. Man, you don't know what it means to have a bride like that. Christian friend, I want to ask you something tonight. It's going to be important. Think it through seriously. Are you all in for the Savior? The finish line's just ahead. It's the prize of the high calling, literally the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. The rapture, that's the finish line. It's just ahead. Are you all in? Till Jesus takes you home. Now tonight I want to do this. If you're not afraid or ashamed, in any way hesitant, you're in no way hesitant to declare this, Lord I'm all in for you. I'm all in for you. Now be careful. You're going to understand tomorrow night, going all in costs you something. But it's worth it. How can we do anything but be all in considering Jesus was all in for us? If tonight you'd be willing to say to the Lord and mean it as a Christian, Lord, I'm all in for you. I want to invite you to do something. Would you just step from where you're currently seated? Find yourself a spot around this altar and just tell the Lord that I'm all in for you. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed. Father, would you bless this very brief but vitally important invitation. And Father, for your glory, for the good of this church and for the good of your church all over the world, I pray that tonight God's people would be unafraid and unashamed to say, Lord, I'm all in for you. I'm all in for you. Lord, may we do it because you were all in for us. And Father, for how you work, we're going to give you glory. I'm all in for you, Lord. God bless you, folks. 
Jesus, I'm all in for you. No games being played. Nothing being held back. Jesus, I'm all in. All in for you. All in for you. Preacher, why? Why are you preaching on prophetic themes this week? Because Jesus is coming, that's why. Tomorrow night is going to be a giant exclamation point on why I am where I am right now in my life and ministry. I love my country. But folks, we're in more trouble than we've ever dreamed we'd, we'd ever be in ever in our history. And we've had some troublesome times. But we're in more trouble now than we've ever been. But that kind of trouble is an opportunity for God to work through His people if we'll just be all in. All in. Father, would you help those that have gathered around this altar tonight? Lord, some back at their seat are doing the same thing. They're just simply telling you, I'm all in for you. Father, I pray this would not be a decision based or made on emotion or made because somebody else stepped and came forward. Father, I pray none of that would be the case. I pray we'd be all in genuinely. Lord, if we are, Lord, it'll change how we live. And so, Lord, I pray over the next two nights you would further arrest our attention. And, Lord, help us to understand the phenomenal time we're living in. And the fact, Lord, you've left us here on mission. You've left us here with something to fulfill. Father, may we not blow it in these strategic days at this critical juncture. But Lord, may we accomplish the mission that you've left us here to fulfill and that's to reach a lost world with the gospel. Equip us, O God, with both the desire and the dynamic power of your Holy Spirit to accomplish that task. And Father, for what you'll do and how you'll work, we're going to give you glory. For it's in your precious name I do pray and ask these things. And all God's people who prayed with me said, Amen. Now, folk, if you're down front, just look up at me. I want to say one thing as Pastor Steve comes to close the service. The Bible says, In such a time as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. I can remember in the 70s, you couldn't go through a revival week without at least one message on the return of Christ. There was a gentleman by the name of Daryl Dunn. Does that name ring a bell with anybody in this room? My daddy had him come to our church. Every sermon was on the return of Jesus in the 70s. It was 1973. I'll never forget it. I thought, I'm four years away from graduating from high school. I'll never graduate. I'll never get married. Jesus is coming back before that. That's been over 55 years ago. And he hadn't come. You know what? Looking back in retrospect, I get it. Everybody was talking about Jesus' return. He wasn't coming then. You know what's happening right now? I've surveyed major denominational churches and major denominational pulpits. Independent Baptist as well. Do you know how rare it is to have a pastor stand behind? Not here. But do you know how rare it is elsewhere to have a pastor stand behind a pulpit and just have the old-fashioned courage to preach on Jesus' return? It's not happening. Now, there's a few people on the national stage doing it, but not many. In such an hour as you think not, Jesus said, that's when I'm coming. Folks, we're there. Look up. Our redemption's about to draw nigh. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Pastor, you come. Well, what a message tonight. And uh, hey, can we do this before we go this evening? Let's sing this little chorus. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And especially in these last days that we're living, I think that's good counsel. Let's sing it together. I want you to lift up your voices. Let's sing it. Ready? Turn your eyes upon
people. Thank you very much. Wow, great. Thank you, preacher. Thank you so much for the great message. You enjoy that tonight? Amen. Wonderful. You know, this is, this is premium, getting us ready for the return of the Lord. I can't help but believe that he is, he is right around the corner. And I, I, I've heard that as well. People say, but, but preachers have been preaching it all these years, and it's never happened. But I believe we can say this. We've never seen That's right. things happening then like we're seeing now. And so it's coming, church. It's coming. And so we'll thank God that we can take a few days and the Lord can send us someone to help us get ready for that coming. And so what a great, great message. And we uh, are glad if you watch by way of online today. We're so thankful that you tuned in. And I hope you will call us if you made that decision. And then it's great to have, uh, great to have the nuns with us tonight, the Clarks with us tonight. Didn't they do a great job? Yeah. Amen. Give them a hand. Amen. Great job tonight. These are, uh, these are some of the dearest friends we have, and not just in the ministry, but some of the dearest friends we have in life. And I, they stay on the go a lot, and I, I appreciate them coming and being such, such a blessing uh, to us tonight. And then Brother Dave drove up from Conley Springs, and um, he's got a pretty good little hike, and I appreciate him coming every day and just being such a blessing to us. Wow, I can't wait till tomorrow night. Amen. So bring your Bible. And bring something to take some notes with. And uh, I'm excited to see what the Lord is going to do. I apologize for the distraction earlier. But we are committed to taking care of this congregation. And we are going to, we're going to, we're going to protect you at, at all odds. And so I, I, I'm so sorry that happened as you were starting. But, but it was something that needed to be handled. And so, anyway, most of you sitting toward the front don't even know what we're talking about. And that's, that's a good thing. Amen. And by the way, that's another reason to sit at the front. Amen. Amen. Um, Amen. Uh, and so, anyway, listen, good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I, I can guarantee you this. Uh, the devil is not excited about what's going on. And he, he does not want it to happen. And so, that, that ought to just fuel the fire that much more to say, you know what, let's keep going for the cause of Christ. That ought to, listen, that ought to just give us more and more passion to say that for, because of that, we're going to serve Christ like never before, and we are all in. And so what a great word tonight. Listen, I'm going to ask Brother Dave if he'll go back to the back just for a few minutes. He may have to leave, and so um, anyway, he'll be back there for just a little bit. And then be sure you find the nuns tonight, the Clarks. Be sure you welcome them to Calvary. And then all of those who are visiting tonight, we're so delighted to have you Thank you for being a part of our service, and uh, we're going to do this tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock. The doors will be open much sooner than that, so you get here a little early if you can for fellowship, and be thinking of someone that you can invite back tomorrow night, and so send someone a text or give someone a call and encourage them to be back tomorrow night. Where is America in prophecy? And uh, something everybody needs to hear. So I hope you'll bring somebody back with you tomorrow night. Let's bow and be dismissed in a word of prayer tonight. Father, we love you and thank you so much for the privilege to be, uh, Lord, in your house tonight. Lord, it's been a great night. And we thank you and praise you for your blessings. And Lord, thank you for the wonderful music. Lord, thank you for the great singing tonight, the singing of the choir. Lord, thank you for sending the nuns and the clerks our way tonight. And Lord, what a blessing they were And then, Lord, I thank you for this incredible message that you gave your man. And, Lord, how it has challenged us tonight and encouraged us. And then, Lord, tomorrow night, God, in Wednesday night, Lord, I pray that if it be in thy will and if you tarry your coming, Lord, that you would do great and mighty things. And, Lord, I pray that you'd work in and through the service. And I pray that you'd work in and through the live stream. And I pray that people would come and that souls would be saved and that the saints of God would be edified and encouraged. Go with us now. Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Give us safety home, please. And Lord, thank you for a home to go safely to. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake, amen. Thank you for joining us today. We consider it an honor to serve you. And our prayer is that the service was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. If you were impacted today by the preaching of God's Word, we encourage you to respond. If we can pray with you, 
or if you would like to make a decision today for Christ, please call us here at 704-327-5662. We have people waiting right now on the lines prepared to help you. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to welcome you again soon. Have a wonderful week.